Welcome to the Physiatry Mentors. I'm Dr. Sheena Buba. I'm Dr. Benita Williams. And together we are Shanisha. Shanisha. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right. Well, I'm super excited to introduce our guest today. We have Dr. Peter Derman, who is a friend of mine and also a work colleague at Texas Back Institute, and Dr. Antonio Webb, who just graduated recently from our Ortho Spine Fellowship. So you may know him from YouTube. I'm sure um, some of our people that are watching today are um, big fans of Dr. Webb here. So um, today we're doing a little something different. So obviously these gentlemen are not PM&R physicians. They are orthopedic spine surgeons. And so we're going to kind of talk about fostering that relationship be between PM&R and spine and kind of what all that involves and what we can do on our side to kind of uh, make that relationship stronger. So thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. Yes, thank you guys. We appreciate it. We definitely work with multiple specialties, but spine surgery, neurosurgery, ortho surgery are probably the top specialty that we work with. I talk to ortho spine and neurosurgery almost every single day. So we appreciate you guys being on. Um, so if you guys could go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us where you're from, where you went to undergrad and the um, rest of your training. Peter, sure, Dr. I'll, Derman. I'll start. Um, Peter Derman, nice to meet everybody, orthopedic spine surgery. Um, I would, I'm from Dallas originally and grew up here and then kind of trained and was educated all over the country. So I, I did my undergraduate at Stanford University, which was great. I was on the gymnastics team there. I was a gymnast all growing up. Uh, you can't tell from Zoom, but um, Dr. Webb is about two and a half feet taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Stanford undergrad, and then I did my uh, medical school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh, where I also did an MBA at Wharton, which was a lot of fun. After that, I did my uh, residency in orthopedic surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Um, so I spent five years there, and then I did my final year of training at Rush in Chicago for my spine fellowship, which was very heavily focused on minimally invasive techniques. And my, my practice really does focus on almost exclusively minimally invasive and now endoscopic spine surgery. And so really trying to figure out what is the smallest, tiniest little intervention I can do, which a lot of the times is non-surgical, we can come back to that. Um, to, to get patients back to the activities they want. So I'm, I'm now about two years into practice at Texas Back Institute. I'm one of the attendings there and really enjoying it. Back in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, it's brought it home, both you and Gina. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hello everyone. My name is Antonio Webb. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana. I uh, joined the military at age 17 and I uh, spent eight years in the uh, US Air Force. Um, so that, that brought me to San Antonio, Texas where I went to uh, college at UTSA here. And then I went to med medical school at Georgetown in DC and came back to uh, San Antonio for my residency at UT San Antonio. And then uh, my spine fellowship at uh, Texas back. And now back in San Antonio, for some reason, I just keep coming back to San Antonio <laughs> uh, for private practice here. Uh, thank you ladies for uh, the invite tonight. We of course, yeah, we appreciate you guys coming on. So um, PM&R obviously is a very small field and oftentimes even medical students aren't really exposed to it during medical school. So unfortunately, there are even some physicians out there who don't even know what PM&R is. They think it's all just pain management and um, plenty of money of relaxation. That's what another uh, term people <laughs> hear all the time. So um, tell us a little bit about when did you first learn about the field? I'll have uh, Antonia can go first. Yeah, so uh, I think I was maybe a, a third year medical student and uh, just hearing about a few people that were applying to the field and I, I knew nothing about it, you know, prior to going to medical school. So uh, I think the first time was kind of third, end of third year, early fourth year when some students that were above me were applying for it. And then a few of my classmates actually uh, went into it. So uh, I learned a little bit more about it uh, then. But like you said, it's one of those specialties that is not very um, kind of in the spotlight and not a lot of people may not know about it, but um, you know, it's a, uh, seems like a great career field and uh, something that, you know, it's, it's really good also that you guys are doing stuff like this to, you know, shed more light on the uh, field itself. What about you, Peter? So 
I think I was first exposed to it. Um, probably about the same, probably third year medical school. Um, interestingly, by one of my, my classmates, like I, I, we weren't formally introduced to it in medical school, but one of my classmates who's a, a PMNR pain management, very spine focused um, doctor at Utah right now, University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Zach McCormick, great guy if any, anyone needs anyone in Utah. Um, he, he was kind of like ortho minded, like, like me, he was an athlete, he was a decathlete through college and then was, I think, thinking about surgery and then found himself in PMNR and, and really had a great mentor in medical school. And so I kind of learned about it through him. And then in residency, you know, when I was doing orthopedic residency, especially when we had patients with kind of in acute rehab and, you know, multiple extremity injuries and things like that. I would every once in a while go up and round in the acute rehab unit and interact with the PMNR residents there. Yeah, that, that's another thing we did in my residency program, our intern year. I think we spent maybe uh, six weeks um, doing um, working with a physiatrist and in, inpatient rehab. And also we have some uh, PMR residents that rotate with us at the VA and that's during their, I believe their second and their third year. So. Um, I thought that's, that's we'll, great. We'll yeah. merge both of the uh, specialties together. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys had pretty good exposure. It, you kind of fell into it. I think a lot of people in medical school kind of just run into PMNR. Um, and I think a lot of people who go into PMNR were or interested in ortho because they all would like the musculoskeletal aspects of it, right? Yeah. Um, so Peter, tell us how has your experience changed from, have, from fellowship to being an attending and having PMNR in the same practice? Yeah, interestingly, in my fellowship, for whatever reason, and, and maybe it's the way that Rush is organized, we did not have a lot of direct exposure, not with just, just with PMNR, but with pain management in general. And so at Rush, which is a private practice kind of housed within, affiliated with um, Rush University, um, there's not... I'm not positive, but I don't think there's pain management in the group. It's, it's an orthopedic multi-specialty group. And so, you know, we really didn't interact with anyone. We didn't really send people for injections. We didn't rely very heavily on EMG type stuff. And we can come back to that. Um, but I, I didn't have a lot of it. And so coming into practice and really meeting Sheena, I learned more about kind of what the field does specifically with respect to spine. And, and she would teach me a lot about, you know, I feel like I got like my second fellowship, our first six months of practice, because she'd teach me, I'd be like, hey, I got this, like what injection makes sense here? Or like, should I get an EMG? I'm not really sure, is that gonna be helpful? And, and so Sheena really did teach me a lot. And, and I lean very heavily on, on that kind of data that is generated by PM&R and, and pain management physicians now in my practice. Yeah, I would echo that. You know, I think a good thing about TBI is to uh, that exposure with a physiatry. I remember starting my fellowship and spending some time with uh, Sheena in clinic and just going over physical exam, you know, the different types of injections. Uh, we uh, spent some time learning about EMGs. So yeah, I, you, you uh, let me poke you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and shock you. Right. <laughs> I, think, I think that was uh, extremely helpful because when we're ordering these injections, uh, you know, a lot of people will just put, you know, in injection at L405, but, you know, specifically knowing what type of injection, I think it's important. And also just, um, you know, learning from you as well, you know, how to do those injections. Uh, I think it's an, a, a valuable uh, tool, you know, when starting a practice, especially when things are a little bit slower. Um, I think at this point, you know, I plan to, uh, you know, do some lumbar injections of myself uh, just until I get busy. And, it, you know, if it wasn't for learning that in fellowship, I uh, probably wouldn't be as comfortable uh, doing that. So. so, Antonio, so you, um, as you mentioned, recently graduated from TBI and you're back in San Antonio. Um, I think the practice is called South Texas Spinal Clinic. And it seems like it's a similar setup to TBI in the sense that there are about, you know, 14, 15 spine surgeons and about three PM&R physicians. So, you know, as a new surgeon coming into the practice, um, what do you talk about exactly with those PM&R physicians and, you know, establishing a relationship and kind of, you know, working together? 
Yeah, I think it's really important to, um, you know, stop, establish a relationship kind of early on, you know, you're, you're taking care of patients. And um, I think it's, you know, having that communication where you can go to that, uh, you know, the physician and, you know, talk about, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Um, what are your thoughts? Or let's look at these images together. And I think it goes both ways. If the if physiatrist is, you know, having questions about an MRI scan or a patient who, um, you know, he may not be comfortable with, I think, having that, you know, that uh, open door to come to the surgeon and saying, hey, what do you think about this? So uh, I think, you know, the relationships are extremely important and, uh, you know, just an added benefit of having a physiatrist, um, you know, or several physiatrists in our group is, uh, you know, one of the things that kind of drew me to this group. Can I commandeer the conversation? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask you all a question. So, of course. so you know, our group is 20-ish surgeons now and three physiatrists. It sounds like the group web is joining is similarly heavily weighted to surgeons with a handful of physiatrists. In my practice, about 90% of the patients I see, I do not operate on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe I'm unique because I am very conservative with who I operate on, but I think that any of us is still seeing primarily non-operative patients. And in, in your experience as physiatrists, is, that, is this a common ratio? Like, it seems in an ideal world that it would be, you know, five physiatrists for every one surgeon. That, that would be a, a, a more reasonable and probably a more efficient and effective model. That is a, go ahead. Me. <laughs> Did I say yeah, I know, I was gonna, we have this conversation. For every surgeon, by the way. I, I don't know if I misspoke there. Yeah, no, no, I think that's an excellent question. And we have this conversation amongst their, each other at our job all the time. Um, I think it comes to the fact that many people don't know what p and doctors do. Like I tell people all the time, I'm like, I am a back pain specialist. I'm like, if there's one thing that I know, I know back pain like bread and butter. So, but a lot of um, people just don't know what we do. So they don't know that, you know, if you see back pain, either they're going, they're going to try physical therapy, they'll fail it. If they fail physical therapy, they're automatically going to a spine surgeon. And they're like, oh, it's surgical, surgical. But like you said, most back pain is non-surgical, you know, God willing. But if you can try to other different techniques, because sometimes not just sometimes they're doing the wrong, incorrect type of physical therapy, because as a physiatrist, we have the, we do the exam and we can look at the imaging. So we can be a little bit more specific, like, hey, you know, they need to have a flexion bias program. You want to avoid doing this, this and this that might aggravate it. So um we can always put those little keys in, but no, you are preaching to the choir right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this is why I love like Derman and Webb because we always say like, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when you build these relationships, you want people who are ethical as, and we all know DFW, the marketplace. I mean, they're some of the people out there on both sides and PMR and uh, spine surgery are doing ridiculous things, you know, unnecessary three level fusions, like what it does not make any sense. So um, you bring an excellent point, Peter, there are some practices out there that are, you know, like the opposite ratio, like more interventionalists and then a few surgeons. Um, when I was interviewing, I actually interviewed at both kind of practices. And I, for me personally, I, I knew that I would get busier with the ratio that we have with TBI, right? Yeah, because... it's great for you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so more surgeons, you know, a lot of internal referrals, things, things like that. So for me, it benefited, you know, personally, just like in my career, you know, coming to a place like like TBI. But you're you're absolutely correct. Most back pain is is non-surgical, and I always like to say when you do find that spine surgeon that you work with closely, what I like is that the spine surgeon who has a PMR mindset. You know, like they, you know, uh, kind of stress that conservative care first. And then if that fails, kind of then go on to, to appropriate surgery. So. Right. In Fort Worth, I work pretty closely with Fort Worth Brain and Spine, um, the neurosurgeon Grant Boer, and we came out about the same time. So we kind of can have forged that bond and he had the like minded set. And I team up. I'm like, hey, listen, I think he appreciates when he gets a referral for me. He's like, I know I'm doing surgery on this person because right. it's coming for me. Listen, right. I tried X, Y, and C. And I've right. already had your C done. I've done the injection. I've tried physical therapy. Like this is having surgery. And sometimes I'm like, this person needs surgery today. <laughs> so he's like, I'll get him booked. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you my cell phone after this. Yes, please. <laughs> in case he's busy. <laughs> it's a small world. I actually trained with uh, Grant Boer here in San Antonio. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That is so funny. I'll have to tell him that. I'll have. To, I'll send him this and tell him we gave him a shout out. I <laughs> know he's great. <laughs> um. So yes, we were talking about those relationships in private practice, and you know, like there, we said there's some good team, team and arm pain management doctors. There's some that are not, and it's a big referral source for both ways. So, um, what are you guys looking for? in a pm and doctor to work with them? I think this is good for our fellows and um, res to understand. Great question. So um, I'll start off web and then you can, you can, you can chime in as well. Um, first of all, I never refer somebody to a specialist I haven't met myself. And so, you know, I, I think I, I do like what would I do for my mom? I would never refer my mom to somebody that I don't know and, and you know, trust and, and feel like I know that person, right? Because one, it's my responsibility as a patient. Two, that reflects poorly on you if, if you refer somebody to somebody and then they have a, a negative experience. So first of all, I want to meet anyone who I'm potentially going to send patients to. And a lot of that is early in practice, just getting out and shaking hands. And that's on both sides and just being willing um, to talk to people. So that's, that's the bare minimum. I have to have met the person. The other thing is, um, I guess a couple of things. I have to have a similar mindset to them, right? Like being very conservative, being very thoughtful in the way that you do things, not just injecting everything at the same time. Like I saw somebody recently who got simultaneous medial branch block, epidural steroid injection, and greater trochanteric bursitis injection. And I'm like, how does that help me at all. I have no idea. He's like, yeah, I felt better for a day. What do you think that means? And I'm like, I, I, I do know. not. I don't know. I don't know. And they so, dropped a bomb on you and <laughs> walked away. I don't know. And so like, that is not helpful to me. And, and as I said, I really depend on these injections um, to try to figure out what's the smallest thing I can do. And, and so when they're not done thoughtfully, it just doesn't help me. Like just doing a caudal on somebody who has a focal problem doesn't really help me. So that's, that's another thing. They have to be ethical. Uh, and, and Sheena alluded this, to this before, which, which seems like a low bar, but in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, apparently it is not. Um, so, you know, just talking to someone and feeling them out and, and figuring out what their motivation is. And then if they meet those bars, which, um, which I think should be a given, but unfortunately are not, um, the other big thing is communication for me. Um, you know, sometimes I'll send a patient for just a, an injection, right? And then, and then that doctor is just a, a technician for me. I don't do my own injections as a separate conversation, but actually for practice building, I send my injections out because I think that doing your own injections takes away a great referral source, which is the interventional pain doctors. Um, so like if I'm just sending them for an injection, like communication is maybe less important because they're just a mechanic for me. Not just, I can't do the injection, but you know what I mean? Um, but a lot of the times I'm sending them because I want them to help me figure something out or I want them to help take care of a patient who has a real issue, um, but maybe it's not surgical or maybe it's not surgical right now. And so communication becomes really important. And so any doctor who, who I send a patient to has my cell phone number. And, and I expect that they'll call me and, and let me know what's going on um, and loop me back in if there's any issues, et cetera. And, and I do the same thing. So like I call any doctor who sends me a patient um, after I get that patient. And I think that's the key to really providing high level care of these complex patients. Yeah, I think, you know, that was, you hit the nail on the dot, um, Peter. I think, um, you know, starting my practice, um, you know, a combination of, of those things. I, I think, number one, someone who's ethical and, you know, word gets out really fast, you know, who's the uh, bad players in town and, you know, who, who are the, uh, you know, the, the good physiatrists that uh, may be good to take care of your patients. Um, I, I think number two, uh, communication. Um, I plan to give out my cell phone and be very easily accessible and Hey, you know, I injected Mrs. Uh, so and so today, and uh, she'll be coming back to your office. So, I think uh, someone who um, does not inject the patient twelve times before they send them back to you, you know, I, I think having a that's something I learned in fellowship. 
just having that communication with them and say, hey, you inject them once and then, you know, have them come back and see me and we'll see how that goes. I think another good thing about uh, sending um, the injections out is for that patient to almost get like a second opinion. Um, you know, the patient is not directly just relying on what you think is going on with their spine, but they go to see the physiatrist and the physiatrist is saying the same thing. Um, you know, I, I think that's more reassuring uh, for the patient. So um, for me, you know, building my practice, I think someone who's ethical, someone who uh, communicates um, that's open to that as well, and, you know, and someone who, um, you know, someone that I can trust. And, you know, I, I agree with Peter, you know, just meeting people and going out and I guess it's uh, bumping elbows now, not necessarily shaking hands, but uh, yeah. I think that's really Air important. High five. The uh, other thing, the other thing, Webb, is, you know, if, if you were going to send your family member for an injection, you'd want to send them to somebody that that's all that they do. You know, like these ladies did fellowships in this kind of stuff and you, you spent some time. I've, I've never seen an injection in my life. Um, and so, you know, it's just, just cause it's not spine surgery doesn't mean that there aren't nuances to it. And so there's about zero chance I can do an injection, um, you know, one tenth as well as Dr. Buva can. And so, you know, for my patients, I just want them to go to the very best person for whatever it is that they're getting. Um, which is another reason that I, you know, I'm just not a dabbler. And that can go both ways, right? So in pm &R now, there are a lot of procedures that are touted as minimally invasive or, you know, the milled procedure. And uh, <laughs> so there is a lot of overlap sometimes, and I, that can be a, a whole other talk. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's a follow-up question for you, for you ladies. Uh, what do you look for when you're sending patients something that's surgical? Uh, there's a lot of spine surgeons out there. What do you look mm -hmm. for in how do you decide which spine surgeon to send to? It may be a little bit easier to have spine surgeons in your group, but um, I wanted to see what your thoughts were also. No, I think he's very similar. Like, I look for someone who's at a level fusion. Yeah. <laughs> Multi-level fusion when it's not needed for someone who's able to communicate with me. Um, like I said, Brandon and I, we text each other all the time. I've met him personally when he first started, so we forged that relationship and were able to build like that. My patients that I have sent to him, they love him. They have very good things to say, and that's important. We're at the same hospital, so I do consults on the hospital. So a lot of time I'm able to go actually see my patient in the hospital and see how they're doing and get their reassurance. And they're always happy to see me when I walk in. They're like, thank you so much. So yeah, communication and being ethical are two huge things. I, oh, Sheena, you go for it. And then no, I have yeah. a follow-up question that yeah. you made me think of. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with that. I think uh, communication is key. Someone who, like Peter, he he's not joking when he says that he calls every single doctor that's sent, like we would be in clinic and he'd be done with the patient. He'd get on the cell phone and call and be on with an MA like, oh, I'll wait, you know, until the doctor's free. Like when we first started, like I was like, oh, wow, that that's pretty neat. You don't see that very often from a surgeon. And then even yeah. like in patients that we have similar, like I can easily just look up the patient in the chart and kind of see, oh, how did the consult go with, with Derman? But he then sends me an email that, you know, by the end of that evening telling me this is what the plan, like this is what he thinks. So like how often do, do surgeons do that? So I think yeah, finding someone amazing. like that, um, and Antonio, I think, you know, if I'm sure you will, but you kind of, those are some of the things that I think will really uh, help kind of establish you as a, you know, as a special, as a good surgeon, you know, for your uh, more conservative colleagues. <clears throat> and then, um, no, just like, just easy communication. Someone who's like friendly, right? So there's always like, you know, this surgeons have this like, oh, they're super intimidating or, you know, they're hard to get a hold of, but someone who, you know, gives you their cell phone or email or something where they're easily accessible, I think is, is saying something as well, that they respect um, you as a PM&R physician and they're not just using you for, you know, just an injection or whatever and or, or pain medications or anything like that. So, you yeah. know. That actually answered my question. I was curious if, if like they, you know, I think that the communication is appreciated um, and, and I think that we can't get better without feedback. Right. And so, especially for the patients that I just, just send you for an injection, you don't see them back. And so unless I tell you how they did, right. 
then like, how are you ever supposed to know? And like, maybe, yeah. maybe it was a tough injection and, or, you know, maybe something was like a little bit different. And, and if I don't provide you like, Hey, I saw that patient back, they, they did great. Or they didn't, they didn't get any response at all. It's, it's, I feel like hard for you, at least in my mind to then make adjustments based on that. I agree because what I used to do when I first started and you, sometimes you do like 15, 20 injections a day. So I would like keep note of how these people did. And then like 10 days later, I would go in their chart and like, look, oh, they had their follow-up appointment with so-and-so, you know, how did it like, it was just too much. Like I already spent so much time, like, you know, uh, going over the charts, like do my chart review for the next day. So it was just too much, you know, burnout is, is a real thing. So I, I definitely appreciate when you give that feedback. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we have some questions here. Let's see. Carter says, I understand sometimes spine surgeons refer to PMNR for EMGs. So how can an EMG help spine surgeons as they consider surgery with their patients? Webb, I've taken everyone first. I feel like I'm <laughs> it's part of my Napoleonic complex. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Carter, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, EMGs are just part of the workup of a uh, patient who has a suspected um, uh, nerve injury or who has a, um, let's say, a radiculopathy or just some type of um, something you're just not sure of. I think uh, EMG can help you um, decide whether to uh, pursue one path or versus another. So if a patient who has a, um, let's say, L5 radiculopathy and you're unsure whether that, um, you know, that, that, uh, that, that radiculopathy is coming from the spine or, you know, coming from another portion of the body, I, I think an EMG can help di di differentiate uh, where that uh, radiculopathy is coming from. So uh, for me, I, I think I plan to use them um, in a patient who um, I'm just not quite sure about whether, you know, the, where the pain is coming from to help me decide which path to take, whether, you know, that's an injection or to continue watching it or to uh, operate, it, you know, offer surgery to a patient. So um, curious to see what Peter. Yes, it's similar. So for me, an, e an EMG is not standard. So an, an EMG, which is apparently not terribly pleasant, it sounds like Webb could tell us, <laughs> um, is for a patient where in which things just aren't quite adding up. And, and it gives me some additional objective information if I'm having to make a decision particularly about surgery. And, and as I kind of alluded to, you know, my background's minimally invasive and, and part of that is a bunch of techniques. I make very tiny incisions, which makes me excited, but really the philosophy of minimally invasive is trying to figure out exactly where the problem is coming from so that I can figure out the smallest, tiniest thing I can do to take care of it. And, and sometimes an EMG is what you need to help filter the signal from the noise. So somebody's got stenosis all up and down their back. They've got vague arm, you know, arm symptoms, say, they've, say we're talking cervical, vague arm symptoms, hard to tell what nerve it might be. Um, and an EMG can sometimes point you in the direction of a more specific site. The other thing is sometimes they have vague symptoms and you're like, is this coming from their spine at all? And so I'll use an EMG in patients. Sometimes I'm like, I don't think this patient's problem is spine related, but I don't want to blow them off because I can't, you know, I can't prove that for sure. And an EMG can give me additional information. If they don't have a radiculopathy, I can say with, you know, more confidence, I don't think your problem's coming from your back. I'm not blowing you off. You have a real problem. It's just not, we don't have objective evidence that's coming from your spine. Um, you know, there's peripheral nerve compression, there's peripheral neuropathy, all of those kind of things can show up on an EMG. And you certainly don't want to be doing spine surgery if somebody's problem is carpal tunnel syndrome. Right. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. Which, which I'm sure we've all seen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So Felicia, we talked about this a little bit, but Felicia wants to know, what are the dynamics of the referral relationship between physiatrists and surgeons? Are the physiatrists sending patients to the surgeons or the other way around or both? Both. Both. Yeah. Both. For sure. Both. Yeah. I mean, you're, if, um, 
it's a relationship, right? And so, you know, a relationship, I, a relationship is given, and, give and give, right? Um, and so, you know, that relationship is going to dry up if if it's not, um, you know, reciprocal, basically. No, that's totally right. That's something you definitely have to think about um, in in private practice, right? You have to keep. Um, your referrals coming in and, and all that. So um, let's see here. What's the best communication between a physiatrist and surgeons? Is phone communication always necessary or like, can you just have good notes in the patient's chart? <laughs> no, one wants to. no one gets your notes. I can't find them. They're not in my chart. I, I you know, no one gets your notes. So if there's a, if there's something unusual going on, get on the phone, send a text, be HIPAA compliant, of course, you know, there's asterisk <laughs> HIPAA compliance, I've, but your note is not enough. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. Uh, Being more urgent, mm -hmm. myelopathy, cauda equina, something like that. I think, you know, a phone call, um, it, you know, is um, probably deemed necessary at that point. And that, that's why it's important to have a good relationship, working relationship, you know, Sheena and Peter, there, he can just get on the phone and call her and she can call him. So, I think finding someone like that that you're comfortable with, just getting on the phone or sending them a text is, uh, you know, extremely helpful to uh, take care of these patients. Although, Benicia, you're in the same yeah. hospital yeah. as the doctor that you frequently work with. So maybe you guys share an EMR. We don't share an EMR with anyone. So, so you know, in that scenario, maybe, maybe just the note would be sufficient. I just never get anyone's notes. Well, only for for clinic we do not because because we're both private practice. But like in the hospital we can. But yeah, we usually text each other. We actually prefer bit emoji is our main form of text. Not just <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we do a lot of text messages unless something is emergent. Like I did have an emergent situation. I called him and he took care of it right away. Had the patient in the next day. So yeah. I mean, I prefer text anyway. That way you yeah, can just. Yeah. I mean, rarely during the day am I just chilling out. Like oh, let's chat on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> if you call me, I will pick up the phone because right. it's be urgent. Right. All right. So right. Carter, <laughs> he's trying to make a connection with you, Dr. Durbin. So he's wondering if he can get your contact info. He is um, a PMR resident that we both know. He's a great guy. Absolutely. Um, he grew up in Utah and is am interested in interventional spine, and he'd like to network with you with uh, Dr. McCormick. So oh, perfect. Know. Yeah, I'm happy to make the connection. Zach's a great guy. This is this is how it works, guys. Networking. You have Absolutely. to reach out and ask. True. All right. Um, another one is, so Dr. Derman mentioned only referring patients to providers he has met before. So what are some avenues new physicians can meet and network, especially now with COVID going on, you're not, you know, knocking on people's practices and kind of introducing yeah. yourself that way. So any advice guys? I know for me, when I first started, every single networking event that they had, I was at. Um, and we did, you know, a lot of door-to-door -door knocking. Um, but yeah, a lot of times you'll have the TMA will throw different events. But and then in the hospital, you know, it, it helps for me because I go to the hospital, so I'm in the doctor's lounge every day, so I talk to doctors every day. Um, but yeah, if you're not in that situation, networking is huge. So any kind of mixer you can go to. But that was all pre-COVID, so right. yeah. Okay. I, I echo the, those sentiments. I mean, it, I think it depends a little bit upon. The market that you're in so uh, Dallas is very very saturated for spine surgery and and I imagine for interventional pain as well um, so you know my first five six months of practice I wasn't doing a lot of spine anything I was mostly going out and shaking hands and so what I would do I mean your other option is just to sit around and do nothing but you know that doesn't seem effective um, so I would just go to a random hospital, like just go to the hospital or go to any medical office building. I'd walk in in my suit with a stack of business cards in my pocket and I would take the elevator to the top floor. And then I would walk every single floor mm -hmm. of every single professional building in that complex. And I would just unannounced walk into any doctor's office that seemed remotely related to spine and say, hi, I'm Peter Derman. I'm, I'm new in town. Is there anyone I could talk to? And, and you shouldn't feel bashful. I mean, th that's the way that you make connections. And, and I randomly ran into a lot of people who I'm still in touch with from a variety of subspecialties um, doing stuff just like that. So um, obviously harder now um, because of COVID, 
Uh, Dr. Webb is our resident um, social media expert here. So, <laughs> and he's a, he's starting practice right now. So, Webb, how are, how are you going to do this? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I think um, just I, I think meeting physicians kind of like in the doctor's lounge or at the hospital, like if you, you run into a physician. Um, um, you know, rounding at the hospital. I, I think that's another way to meet, you know, other specialties. But I, I think now with COVID, I, I think social media is coming more of uh, something that's really um, necessary and essential just because it's hard to get out. A lot of practices are not allowing people to come in their doors. So I think LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a uh, great resource. Um, I, I've already had I don't know, maybe four or five primary care doctors reach out to me or I've already talked awesome. to them uh, just to establish that relationship. And then at some point I will eventually, you know, go by and meet him or her. But um, I've had patients that re reached out to me already, uh, you know, uh, patients who already scheduled appointments to uh, see me. Uh, and um, I, I start in a few weeks and that, that's just from uh, social media. So I, I think um, having some type of presence online when people search for, you know, back pain or neck pain and those things. I think that's a great way to uh, kind of build your practice. But um, yeah, I had a nephrologist reach out to me on Instagram and we're supposed to meet up for lunch um, at some point. But yeah, I think social media is probably the way to go at this point. You should do like a, either a Zoom or a Facebook Live and be like, it's a happy hour from this hour to this hour. Give everyone the links they sign on for different physicians. Like, hey, if you want to pop on and meet me for two minutes, you know, I'll be on here. Yeah, that's that's a great I way. I, I lecture, um, had a Q&A &A with about 40 chiropractors uh, this past week and then um, uh, primary care physicians office. Mm -hmm. I have a lecture coming up um, next month where... Um, their group is probably about 50 primary care doctors here in town. Wow. So I'll just be giving a lecture to them and meeting people that way. And eventually at some point uh, meeting them in person. So uh, you know. that is huge. Um, Omar Swad, who's my mentor and my partner, he's big on giving lectures. So he definitely encouraged me to do that when I first started. I gave a lecture like at the PA, Texas PA mm -hmm. had a conference. I gave a lecture on back pain there. Um, even the residents, we usually give like a bi-monthly um, lecture to them. So, you know, when they graduate, they'll know who you are. So, no, that's an excellent idea. Anytime you can get in front of a bunch of primary care doctors and give a lecture, they'll remember who you are. In um, Texas now and, and in some other states, um, physical therapists don't necessarily need a, re a referral anymore to initiate physical therapy. And, and that's relatively new in Texas. Um, and so physical therapists have now become quite a good referral source. Um, and so don't overlook therapists. I doubt a PMNR doctor would ever overlook therapists, <laughs> but, but don't overlook therapists as a, a group that you should be reaching out to too. So I've done some lectures, uh, Zoom type lectures for physical therapy groups, which have forged some really good relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's direct access. So our state is not like a full direct access. So the patient can definitely go um, get um, evaluated and have, I think it's like 10 days or something or um, mm -hmm. something yeah, like that. Yeah, a limited number of visits. Yep. And yeah. then, then they can be referred to a physician for, you know, evaluation. So you can be that physician if you just um, reach out. And all this is free, right? LinkedIn is free. You sign up. It's super easy to search DFW, just type in spine surgeon or PM&R and then click connect, connect, and then just send, send a quick message be like, hey. And then even like reaching out to practices, you may not have a practice that has like 50, um, you know, primary care physicians or 40 chiropractors, but, you know, find maybe an orthopedic practice and contact their um, HR person or some, you know, person, whatever contact is on the website and ask, hey, can we set up a Zoom meeting between, you know, doctor so-and-so. And I know like TBI, we've done that with a few um, physicians and um, it's been, it's been nice. So. Yeah, and another thing social media provides is, um, you know, your referring providers or even patients don't even have to uh, be local in your area. Um, you know, the two, the few patients that I have scheduled coming up uh, for my clinic are actually flying in to uh, see me from other states. So, and, you know, I've had some people reach out um, for someone to refer in their area, like in Miami or California. So, hey, do you, I see you're a spine surgeon. Do you know anyone in this area? So, um, you know, if I have a good relationship or 
uh, trust someone in that area, you know, I'll, you know, send that patient or give that patient that surgeon's information. So, uh, you know, social media is uh, great in that way to kind of connect people from, you know, all over the world. Well, that feeds into the telemedicine conversation as well. And now we're, it's a little bit off topic, but it, it, part of the conversation here, which is that, you know, we're no longer limited by, you know, a driving distance away from us. And so especially those of us who are providing kind of unique services, endoscopic spine surgery, things that are not, you know, widespread, people are willing to travel for. The question becomes, um, you know, you know, my surgery is something that I do, and then the patient goes home, and they can fly home, and I can do telemed with them. For PM&R, is that really a model that makes sense for you guys or, or do you need to be closer to your patient? I mean, yeah, it's always nice. The PM&R, we, you know, we have like closer follow-up, right? You know, we send them with to physical therapy or, you know, obviously you can't do EMGs or injections. Right. It's um, hard. Like I only right? do one intervention on that, right. <laughs> if anything, right. but, but you will likely do multiple. Right. Like if I'm doing like medo branch blocks to see if they are a candidate for an ablation, I have to do two, you know, and so that relationship will last a little bit longer. So it's a little bit hard. So I've had patients, you know, with this telemedicine, they live in, um, Amarillo or even like Oklahoma, Arkansas. And then we're talking about, you know, treating their axial back pain. And I say, you know, it may be like four times you may have to come in to, you know, get these procedures done. And so um, if I know someone who I, I know is good and I trust, you know, I'd be like, hey, you know, you know, this is my plan. I'll be happy to send this, you know, to this physician that I know and I know would do a good job kind of thing, just so it's more convenient for them. But yeah, at least they get to consult with me and kind of you know, see what I think about their issue. Yeah. Great questions. I think we can wrap it up. We have any more questions out in the audience, guys? My mom says hi. <laughs> hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have any more, but yeah, no, you guys, this is great. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for taking the time out. We have one more question, right, Benicia? We do. I um, almost <laughs> forgot. Um, we ask all of our guests that if you were not a physician, what would you be? Mm. <laughs> That's an easy question for me. What would you be? I would be a, a brewmaster. <laughs> I brew a lot of beer. Um, it's like my hobby. It's how fun. You yeah. Need so to my wife and I, my wife and I brew beer. We have, it's gotten like a little bit out of hand in our house. It's, it looks like breaking bad in our house, but like, beer I love brew. it. So there's like things whirring and stirring and spinning and bubbling and stuff. Um, and we have a kegerator in our house. So we like keg our own beer and all kinds of stuff. So we'll that's like our retirement plan. I love, you'll have to meet our good friend, uh, Sebastian Benz, who's moving oh, yeah. back. Oh, yeah, they, their brewery. His yep. family owns a uh, Lakewood Brewery. Oh, so really? we have That's to go. Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we'll go. We'll do a social, a social distancing when he gets back. And <laughs> Love it. So, yeah, it's so nice there. We had a great time. <laughs> yeah. Antonio. Uh, the, um, it, it, it would either have to be a, either a chef or a videographer. Uh, you know, one of my passions is uh, cinematography and videography. So um, either one of those two. Did you get into cinematography and videography after doing more social media stuff or did you have an interest in it before? Yeah, before. And, um, you know, currently when I was in Dallas, I was actually working with a film instructor. So we meet and go over uh, certain things about shooting and, and um, different scenes and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's That's been really my cool. Have you all already answered this question on previous episodes? Yeah. <laughs> on our very first one, uh, I would... <laughs> but I will say I would probably I said <laughs> two things I would be um, a makeup artist because I like be the beauty industry my best friend's a makeup artist so that's probably what in the second answer I'll say is like I would be a trophy wife <laughs> <laughs> trophy oh. wife just kidding I'm just kidding <laughs> I used to say I used to say stay at home dad and then I had some kids and I'm like that is a tough job I <laughs> trophy I can dad you would be a trophy husband then <laughs> What'd you say, Webb? I said, I can tell you all about that stand at home dad. It's, uh, it, oh my it's, God. <laughs> I love my, my sons, but uh, yeah, they, they are a handful. 
All right, guys. Yeah, well, did, yeah. did tell them what you would be. Yeah. Oh, I, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure you guys know, you know, I love making spreadsheets. I love planning. And so I would, um, and I love travel. So I would be a travel agent. Oh, Easy. Man. Pretty much. You'd be, travel. Out of, you'd be out of, this, of your job right now. No job. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good thing you became a doctor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was super fun. Um, we will get this posted on YouTube. I'll edit it, especially that beginning part, and it'll be on IGTV and Facebook Live as well. So um, also we have a podcast, so it'll be on that, Spotify and iTunes. You can listen to it there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thanks um, before, again. Yeah, follow us on all our social media accounts. We're the Virtual Physiatry Mentors on Facebook, Instagram, and um, both she and I are on Twitter as well as Facebook. And um, we have a busy week with IG takeovers this week. We have UT Southwestern coming up and taking over our IG tomorrow. So join us next Sunday. We'll have two pediatric pain management physicians that will be on um, Dr. Tate and Dr. Andrew Collins. So um, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.